J.M. Yinger defined religion as a system of beliefs and practices by means of which a group of people struggle with the ultimate problems of human life. Institutions such as synagogues, churches, and mosques become the backdrop where one's faith is historically practiced. While there's no doubt that God can reach you anywhere, societal norms have come to accept that the physical space where people gather together for worship is an artifact of modern day culture. The scripture Matthew 18 20 says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This scripture creates the context of worship where people come together in fellowship to worship the creator. Revelations 19 and seven speaks about the church being the bride of Christ and is made up of all who love him. So in essence, the church is the people of Christ and not the physical buildings that have been created by man for worship. In 1940, approximately 70% of Americans were members of a church, synagogue, or mosque. Today, that number is less than 50% and is steadily declining. The people of Christ do not require a physical building to connect with him, and the drama and politics that are now commonplace in our brick and mortar places of worship are causing people to turn away from membership. Juxtapose COVID-19, where people were able to connect virtually to places of worship and fellowship virtually without all the drama, and you see an even more rapid decline. It's projected that some of those people will never come back to physical church again not just because of the convenience factor, but because they are fed up with the drama and confusion inside the church. The church for many now mirrors the racism, sexism, corruption, and politics of society. In 2018, over 4,000 churches closed and approximately 1,700 pastors are leaving the ministry every month. Those who believe the church could straddle politics are sadly mistaken. Politics is very much a part of the church, so much so that pastors have received votes of no confidence or have been asked to resign over speaking about refugees and racism, and approximately 80% of pastors saying their ministerial practice has been negatively affecting their families. The rise of the mega churches has additionally put emphasis on the business of church. Members report being lonely and unable to connect or having to produce financial statements to verify tithing. Members are being asked to subsidize jets and excesses being justified by prosperity ministries. People are now saying no more and are opting for smaller churches where they're actually known and can have their spiritual needs met. Whether it be loneliness, politics, racism, or sexism, Man's church, not the body of Christ, is being rejected by God's people. The nastiness, the pettiness is of man's doing, not God's, as we continue to show God that we are incapable of managing ourselves without him. Churches are waging war within instead of directing their collective energies to destroying the true enemy. Some call it spiritual warfare, where Satan seeks to take advantage of those who are focused outward on man instead of inward on Christ. The church should be a place where people are loved collectively instead of judged individually. Now we see investigations, lawsuits, and mayhem because people have taken their focus off of Christ and away from actually making people better versions of themselves. The people on the outside see the chaos and are choosing to connect with God outside of these arenas as they are finding anything but God in these spaces. From clout chasing by using titles to intimidate members because they didn't have an official office to just flat out making people feel unwelcome, church folks are taking the joy out of serving and working inside the church. 
Case in point, during the eulogy for the Queen of Soul, the eulogist remarked, a black woman cannot raise a black boy to be a man. Perhaps he was unaware that black women are the head of 27% of all black households and between 66 to 88% of membership of black churches. Needless to say, this brother was swiftly called out for his misogynistic and sexist opinion. While the black church has empowered women at lower levels of service, many of the positions of power are held by men. A recent look at the National Baptist Convention state roster of presidents found no women when the vast majority of these institutions are being carried financially by women. Today we are looking at church folk, the people who tirelessly work to drive people away with their style of piousness and religion. We don't have all the answers, but we do have the research to describe the behaviors and offer warning that the exodus will continue if we don't give people on the outside something better than what they are experiencing now. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Tabernacle Talks, and I am so delighted to have my guest today, Dr. Yurita Taylor. Hi, Dr. Taylor. How are you? Hi, Dr. Mobley. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Well, you are just always a delight, and I know that we had the opportunity to talk, and you've done some really interesting research about churches and the behavior of people who attend church members. And I think it's important research uh, for our show today as we're talking about, you know, church folk. And I use that term lovingly, but uh, we do know that church folk, we kind of have some behaviors and some language all of our own. And so I guess I want to start off because I've got so many questions, questions, questions. But obviously, one of my first questions is, are more people attending church? Or do you think less people are attending? What 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 is your research and stuff telling you? And, and if they're not attending, why are they not attending? When I did my research on um, church attendance and whether people were going or not going, this was before COVID nineteen. Okay, I was um, working on my doctorate degree, and um, <clears throat> it was part of research that I was doing, as I said. And what I did was I just wrote some questions on a paper and give, give them to random folks. There wasn't any, okay, I need to go to this color, this age. No, it was just random folks. It was very diversified. And one of the questions I asked them was, do you attend church? And if, why not? It was funny because the majority of the answer was all the same from these different folks. Different people, and they all have one answer in common, the majority of them. The pastor, they were stuck on the pastor as being the reason they weren't attending church. They talked about the behavior of the pastor. So the pastor behaved this way, I'm not going to church. And it's funny because they now one said, okay, I go to Pastor A church and he did this, I'm going to go to Pastor B's church. No, they just stopped going to church altogether. And I can only assume one thing, it's the same thing society does. They, some, they clump the pastor's behavior as one. And some pastors say, you know, this pastor did this. Let me just be judge, jury, executioner, and get rid of the church altogether. But that's it, it, the work of the devil. You know, magnify the behavior of the pastor and pull the people away from church. And that was a common um, answer, the behavior of the pastor. We are all sinners. We're all sinners saved by grace. So when you say the pastor's sin is greater than my sin, so I'm not going to go listen to him. What, where does that leave your relationship with God? And I found that very interesting. Wow. So we, we talk about the, the power structure. We know that the church typically is very hierarchical. And many of the prominent positions in the church are held by men. Why do you think the church has been so slow to empower women? 
quite frankly, some of this, this, first of all, there's a lot of female pastors out there and some of them are great. They're excellent pastors. They preach the word of God. But in my opinion, I don't think just because a woman is not a pastor, she's not being empowered by the church. I have been to quite a few churches in my lifetime and the women are being empowered. Like I said, just because they're not pastors doesn't mean they're not empowered. We, the churches, they're giving women retreats. That's empowering the women. I have been to, like I said, quite a few churches. And the first lady, she has a prominent role. She mm -hmm. is well-respected, well taken care of, and she's treated with such class. And I don't see that as anything less than empowering. So it leads me to say, well, okay, maybe the women are not stepping up more to be pastors because it's a choice. Because I don't, I don't know personally any churches that are holding back women from being empowered. I don't know that per se, but maybe it's a choice. They don't want to be pastors. Maybe they have friends or pastors. I have friends or pastors. And when I think about all the stuff that they go through, I'm like, no, I don't want that job. Maybe it's the same for these women because being a pastor cannot be taken lightly. You have to submit to the will of God in everything. And maybe when they see their husband, friend, cousin, uncle, whomever being a pastor and see the role that they play, maybe they just don't want to do it. But I don't see any church just not empowering their women. I've seen them do that. Like I said, the women retreat. They have marital classes. Women have their own thing to do in the church. But just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you're not being empowered. There was some research that I found when I was preparing for this show by Barna, and it talks about one in three people just have completely turned off from the church. And they, they talked about during times of COVID, while some people easily transitioned to virtual church, some people just turned off completely. Why do you think... Christians have just turned off? That's, that's an interesting question and it really pulled me to do some research on that. One of the things I've noticed is church have been declining over the years, even prior to Barner's, um, when he came out with that, I'm sorry, when he came out with his studies was last year. Prior yes. to that, church was declining. And one of the things that came to mind, and I'm going to read it for you. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the 45 communist goals. Number 27 says, and I'll read it for you. Infiltrate the churches and replace revealed revision with social religion. It says, discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Now, this article came out in 1963. Look at where we're at today. So now, when you have that set in place back in the 60s, that is what we're seeing today. We are going to a spiritual warfare because they had already doomed the church back in the 60s. So it's, it's like I said, it's a spiritual warfare. People are, are shifting away from church. One of the reasons being social media. Social media plays a vital role in what pastors, churches are facing today because everything that has to do with God is being replaced. God says, come as you are. So what do we do? We take it to another level. But then we're forgetting that he also says, every knee shall bow, <laughs> you know? So it's interesting that Everybody is trying to make church to be what they want it to be, but there's only one church. There's only one church, and that's the body of Christ. So ultimately, we can walk away from it if we want, but when that day comes, we have to stand account for the things that we have done, and going to church, listening to his word would be one of them, because that's how we get fed spiritually. I can say, I'm going to stay home and I'm going to read my Bible and do my own church. But I wasn't called to be a pastor. The pastors are called, they have a special calling and there's a reason why they're there. There's a reason why the church is there. When you listen to those pastors on television, they always tell you, Joel Austin being one, always say, find a good biblical church to go to. There's a reason for that. Because our souls need to be fed. 
And when our souls are not fed, social media can come in and take over. These communist rules can come in and become our gospel. And that's, that's what's going on with society today. Every, there's so much negativism against the churches. And we have to, we, the Christians, have to fight to stay on top of it all. And it's not an easy battle. It's not. That's interesting about the impact of social media, because we both know Gen Z and the millennials. I mean, these are the generations, particularly Gen Z, that have just been raised on social media. That's what they know. And the research is saying that they are even less connected to the churches and, and religion. Why do you think... What are we missing in attracting these younger generations to be more connected with the church? I can't say we're missing anything per se. One of the things that I have noticed is that we as Christians, we could raise our children and we could teach them about God. But church is being held one day a week. Society have them the other six days. And when they go out there, your daughter might want to go to church and feel good about going to church. My son might say, well, you know what? I'm not going to church. Your daughter is in the same class with mine. And then my son might be determined, you know what? I am going to pursue her. You see where the influence coming? The peer pressure, social media, the, 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 the friends that they keep, uh, influencing them and showing them, oh, this is what it says here about the Bible. Prove that there's a God. Can you, and and this, these are topics that happen. Prove that there's a God. If there is a God, why do these bad things happen? And that's a common question for everyone across the board. So when you're putting this to young people who are trying to find their way in life, because they're coming into womanhood or manhood and they're trying to find their way in life, now they're even more confused. If there's a God, why are my parents divorced? God said people should be, why are they divorced? If there is a God, why such and such happen? So the question comes into their mind and they don't know how to deal with it. And they just sum it up. You know what? I'm not going to hurt my head. There is no God. I'm just not going to believe anything. And I'm just going to keep it going because it's easier. Walking with God is not easy. We as older folks, older than the teenager, we struggle some days with the struggles that we go through. Imagine the young people, the teenagers who are coming up and they're trying to figure out who they are. They are struggling to figure out why things happen and it's easier not to deal with it. It's easy to shift away from it. Not to mention some of them are saying, going to church is so boring. Why I need to sit in there and listen to someone speak? Because they don't know the importance of church or society is pulling them in a different direction. Powerful. You know, there have been scandals. We, we talk about the scandals in the church. And I think we know probably one of the most widely publicized scandals was in the Catholic Church. But we all know that there have been probably less publicized scandals that are still fraught in every industry. But the church has a unique way of dealing with those kind of scandals. And maybe the legal system has not always been on board or aligned with things that are happening in the church. Do you think that this has helped or hindered the church when we look at issues of racism, sexism, the same things that are happening in the world are happening in the church because people are the church? What guidance or, or, or thoughts do you have about how these things have rendered the church, it's paralyzing the church in, in some cases when you have kids saying, how is that happening inside a church? First of all, none of us are perfect. I want to start by saying that none of us are perfect, okay? We all are going to make mistakes. Do scandals happen inside churches? Yes. Some, should it happen inside of the church? No, that's a question I can't even answer because you have, no one has control over that. But at the same point in time, how it's being handled, it, 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 it's kind of like a touchy situation because some of the, over the years, um, I've noticed that sometimes the scandals come up and um, I can't remember the man's name right now off the top of my head. But like I said, one little thing can overthrow the whole thing. And because pastors are judged all the same, 
what might be construed as a scandal is not necessarily a scandal because Pastor A might be a pastor who gets up and you know what? I am going to follow the word of God. I'm going to play by the book and I'm going to be faithful to my wife. Pastor B might be the one that backslides. Now, Pastor A is judged on that. And if Pastor A now is seen outside with a woman, now there's a scandal created there. How the legal system cannot come in and judge him based on something that didn't happen. You have to prove that something happened before something can be done. There's a, over the years, there's a lot of stuff being said about the churches. Some of it should not have happened. Some of it is appalled in. But ultimately, some of some, even though some of it didn't come to light, God sees everything and he's the judge. He's the one that will judge when judgment day come. We are all accountable for our actions. So if we think, well, the court system should come into the church and play it the way everything else is done out in society, the secular buildings, no, it cannot be done that way. And sometimes it's not done that way. But evil will not prevail because God will come in and judge everyone for their behavior. And that's where I stand on that. God it has the final answer and he will come in and judge everyone for the things that they have done. And I think it's so true that the, the role of the pastor, he, he becomes the central focus of many people in the church. And I found a, a very, I guess, alarming statistic that 80% of the pastors that have participated in this research study said that their families have been negatively affected because of their ministerial service. Uh, can you speak to that for us? Are you seeing that in your counseling practice that crack the families and how they're being impacted because this man of God is trying to be a shepherd to so many people? Pastors have one of the toughest jobs I've ever seen. Actually, they have two tough jobs. They are shepherd over here of the church and then they are husband and, and a father at home. And it's really tough. And most of the time it clashes. And then, you know, you plan everything and you go home, you sit and eat. And then someone from the church called, Pastor, um, my mom is there. We need you to come to the hospital right now. They are being called. It's like they have a 24 seven day a week job. And it takes a toll on the family. It is very stressful because they, they, they're constantly on call. And it affects the family. Yes, it does. Because we know family is important in order for a family to be together. It's like a family who pray together, stay together. And that stands through up to today. But they're being pulled in every dip, different direction. Pastors need help. They need help uh, from the congregation. They need help from the, the um, elders in the church. They need help. They need prayers because they're taking on so much. And sometimes they are trying to, to be that leader for the church, to be that shepherd that God wants them to be. And they're trying to be husbands and fathers, and it's hard. And then it also, it's the negative behavior, the bad behavior, as you say, that surrounds some of these pastors. They're indulging in things that they shouldn't be. And I don't speak for all pastors on this. I don't. But they have some pastors that are engaging in bad behavior that negatively affects the family because now the wife have to hold her head like she didn't know her husband stole from the faith or he didn't have a mistress around her and I won't indulge into anything else but the bad behavior negatively affects the family and another thing that I've come across that I've heard pastors um pastor's wife say is the pastor behave one way at home and he behave another way at church if the behavior is not aligned that creates a problem also because granted that he's not perfect, but your behavior can't be that far-fetched. You can't be at home, you know, pushing on your wife and hitting on your wife and, you know, cussing like a drunken sailor. And then on the pulpit, you're Mr. Holy. If the behavior is that far-fetched, it creates a problem. You are, you are just an amazing not book of walking knowledge here. We, we, we've all seen power plays in church and politics. I, I, I hate to think that we could separate church and politics, but I don't think most people have been able to do that. What do you think is the role of politics? And do you think there should be a role for politics inside the church? I don't think there should be a role for politics, but unfortunately there is. Because sometimes when we go to church, we have, we have these high expectations 
And when you go, when you have high expectations of, let's say, for instance, the pastors, and we seem to be dwelling on the pastors because that's where my research went, um, you have these expectations. So as the littlest thing that they do then become a big thing because you're expecting the pastors to be perfect. Pastors are not perfect. The only perfect being there is, is Jesus Christ. Pastors are doing their best to preach the word of God and people are expecting to be perfect. But also when you go into the church, another thing that um, is becoming a problem in church is some people are very territorial and that creates a problem in the church. You know, I'm the one who does this. You don't need to do this. Okay, the church is growing. So can we expand that role so two people could do the role efficiently or someone could do the role when you're not at church? And it becomes like, okay, this is mine. And the jealousy in church is there. And it, it, it is, it just is. And part of the reason for that is we make the mistake of thinking that the devil doesn't go to church, but he is at church before we get there. And you are not focusing your eyes on Jesus. The devil now is magnifying everybody's mistakes to you. And he's using the pastor's wife as a big thing for that one, because then now she, the devil is working on her. They might just had an argument that morning and they go to church and the, the devil is saying, Oh, he just argued with this one. Look at him up there. And then that's where it starts. Because the devil is going to use every opportunity he gets to break down every church, every church. I want to read something real quick for you. Um, mm -hmm. This is also from the communists. Number 40, it says, discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. Do you see how, and this remember too, was written back in 63. This is what we're facing today. And this is what the devil is using. Fill our minds with all the negative behavior of the man who's standing up in front of you. But we're supposed to be seeing God. That's what we're supposed to be seeing. God is using that man or woman preacher to get the word out to us. But we're supposed to see God in all of that. When we start to see something other than God, that's where the problem comes in. It's interesting that you talk about the jealousy in the church. I know I was reading an article and it clearly said that a lot of people attend church because they like it the way it is. And the minute you try to make a change, it could even be a positive change. Yeah. You could lose a member because you made a positive change. It yes. didn't mean that it was a negative change. It's just they didn't like change. It would have nothing to do with anything other than you move my cheese and I don't like or it. You, or you sit in my seat. Why are you sitting you... in my seat? You know, it, church, yeah, a lot of politics in church. Hey, during um, 2018, and this is pre-COVID, 4,000 churches closed. And I haven't been able to get a, a more updated statistic, but I'm sure with the uh, economic recovery challenges for large retailers, we're certainly going to see that small nonprofits take some significant hits. But what was even more interesting about that statistic is that 1,700 pastors a month were leaving the ministry. Why do you think the pastors are just packing it up? That's a big amount. That, that, that's a huge amount. First, I must say, many are called, but few are chosen. That uh, it is true. Not everybody, the Bible says, not everybody who calls me is going to come with me and know me. I'm like, I do not know you. <laughs> Some of these shepherds are wearing wolf's clothing. And you know what? Uh, God has already started to correct some wrongs in this world. And also, some, um, I, I believe in my, in my opinion, I think what it is is... Um, pastors are burnt out. They are burnt out. It's, it's really um, not an easy hat that they wear. And I sympathize with them. And they are burnt out. And with people leaving church, some of them, their only income was coming from the church. So with the church diminishing, they have no income. So they close the door. Or, you know, the criticism. Some pastors, they withstand the storm. And they write to it. Some of them can't. They don't withstand the storm. But they did the same thing to Jesus. If they can criticize and spit on him, kill him, imagine what they're going to do to us. 
but some of them can't stand it, so they walk away from it. Social media, social media, as soon as you try to do something, I get blasted on social media and I'm not even a pastor. You know, I get out there and I put my post out there and, you know, the negative comments come in, but I just brush it off. And some people are not able to do that. And like I said, many are called for your chosen. If you know that God chose you for this position as a pastor, you stand still. Every day is not going to be sunny. The sun doesn't shine every day, but it's what you do when it rains. And when it's rain, you stand firm in the Stand firm in the word of God and you will make it. He will see you through because guess what? No matter what these pastors did or didn't do, God already forgave them the same grace that he offered you and me. He offered these pastors and he can help them turn it around. All they need to do is they go to him and they confess them sense. He will see them through this, but it's not easy. Not everyone can handle that. Not everyone churches are probably, well, by far, are probably some of the most segregated institutions that we have. Why do you think the church of any institution still has not been able to embrace diversity and we still have black churches and white churches and that doesn't seem to be changing? That, that's a really good question. I think, quite frankly, I've been to a predominantly white church and I've been to a predominantly black church. The worship is different. The worship is different because in a black church, I probably shouldn't say that, but when I go to some churches, they're free to open what their problems are while the other ones, they keep their mouth closed. One of the things that I've learned in writing is that problems are not unique. All problems are not unique. But when you open up and you say, well, um, Dr. Mobley, um, this is the problem that I have. I'm hungry, I have nothing to eat. What do you then now do? The Christ in you now opens up to me and offer me something to eat. But if I, you don't know what my problem is, you can't help me. I think the churches open doors for everyone. I think they do. And they should welcome everyone. But some of the times what I think the churches do is, the members of the churches, they struggle to separate the people from the sin. And if they know you and know you've done something wrong, we become judge, jury, executioner. And then we're saying, okay, I can't worship with this person here. And that causes a lot of segregation, but we are all sinners saved by grace. Which one of us have not sinned? My sin is not greater than your sin. Your sin is not greater than my sin. It's, there's a difference in the churches, yes. Should there be a difference? No. We should all be able to worship same alike. But it would, just for some reason, it will never be there. The Catholic church will never be like the Baptist church. It is just different. And that's the way it's, it's always been. And I'm afraid that's the way it's going to continue to be. The message just have to be the same. But sometimes it's not. It's because mm -hmm. there are cultural nuances to worship. And I think exactly. people are going to attend a church where they feel comfortable, where culturally they can connect because it's about connection to get that message through. Yes. Yeah. So what kind of reforms do you think are going to be necessary for us to save the church? Can we save the church? Because we are the church. We what, can what save kind of the church. First of all, we can't save the church. Only God can. Only he can save the church. What we need to do in every area, submit to God and allow him to make that change because his word never changed. His word is the same and he's not going to change to suit our needs. When we're trying to make all these changes, makes it become a social religion. Is that what it says in the word of God? No, he never said we need a social religion. No, so when we're trying to... to incorporate this kind of music because we need the young crowd to come in. The young crowd is going to like the more jumpy music. As long as your focus is on God, you should be fine. You don't need to change the word. You can't change the word of God anyway. And like I said, it's going to take God to reform these churches. We can't do it. 
that's an effort coming straight from God. We just need to be faithful, keep our eyes on him. And he will, he's the one that's going to deliver all these churches. What trends do you see? Do you see churches maybe are doing the wrong things by chasing these different fads to try to be relevant when the word is always relevant, the word is? And maybe is it our chasing of relevance that's creating the problems? Or do you think that the body needs to make substantive changes to be able to survive? I don't like trends. The trends, there's something about that word, trends, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Mobley, we are in a spiritual warfare, okay? No matter how you put it, we are going through a spiritual warfare and the devil is intended to wipe out churches, get the people corrupt, and they will walk away from God. That's ultimately what he wants to People are walking away from God, yes. But what we have to do as a whole is see it for what it is. And sometimes we can, but God have given us the power. He have given us the power. When we stand in front of evil, we have the power to cast out evil because he already gave us that power. So this trend, there's really no trend that we need that is going to have, the churches are going to be hit harder. Read Revelations, they tell you what is coming. The churches are going to be hit harder. There is going to be chaos, and we're seeing it already. But if we stand firm on the word of God, we can get through this. And remember, not everyone knows who God is, wants to know who God is, or even care. I am surprised the amount of people, grown-ups people, that grown-ups that don't even know who God is. And it is my ignorance, I should say, that I should know. But like I said before, God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He have not changed. His word is the same. And that's what we need to stand fast to. We don't need to, to create a trend to, to change anything. We just need to go back to school. Because when, 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 when our ancestors were trying to get to a church and they were praying, it worked for them. Yeah, they didn't have social media. And it, the church worked for them. The same God that worked for them, that delivered them, the same God that delivered Joseph and delivered Moses is the same God that will deliver us. They were faithful to God. And it, Moses sinned, Joseph sinned, they were sinners. But God delivered them. God delivered Daniel out the lion's den. He will deliver us out of the spiritual warfare that surrounds us. Social media is trying to discredit pastors because that's what they intended to do. In the 45 feminist goals, that's the intention. Let's discriminate. This, let's get rid of the churches. Let's discriminate against the Bible. Let's discredit the, 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 the uh, marriage. No family. Let people divorce because they want to. But that's not what God intended. And God will come. He will come. We don't know when he will come. But all we can do is make sure that we're ready when he come. Pastors, uh, they have a tough job. I can't say that enough. They have a tough job. They struggle in the home. They struggle in the church. They struggle with who they are most days trying to make everything come together. We need to help them. Because all they're doing is being a shepherd that God called them to be. Remember, not everyone that's called <laughs> is chosen. But they have some great pastors out there. And I'm thankful for those pastors. I am. You are amazing. And you know what? I want to give you the last word. If, if there is anything, if someone's watching and, and maybe they're thinking, you know, I haven't been to church in a while. And um Maybe it's because I was focused on the wrong thing and not on God, because that's where the focus should have always been. Right. What would you tell them to invite them back? If there's anyone out there listening who stopped attending church because you think, well, okay, I'm not going to church because this pastor has some sins. Look past the sin because God looked past your sin. He offers you grace every day and we need to offer grace. If you can't forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you. Maybe that church doesn't fit where you, it doesn't feed your soul. 
find another church. Don't just give up. You can't give up on God. You have to feed your soul spiritually because at the end of the day, like I said before, you have to stand in judgment. So if church A doesn't work for you, there are millions of churches in the U.S. There's probably 1,000 church in the state you live in. Find another church and go to, but don't just give up on God because he's not giving up on you. And don't look at the pastors. You will never find a pastor who is perfect. Never. You will never find a pastor who is perfect. We are all imperfect being saved by the grace of God. So if one church doesn't work for you, I suggest you find another church and don't give up on going to church. Wow. Dr. Taylor, thank you. I think if the greatest takeaway I take from you is that Jesus was perfect and they went after him, they killed him. So you're right. I think even for the pastors out there, you need to understand that with spiritual warfare, they're going to come after you. Yes. Because we're human and that's what we do. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. is what we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Taylor, thank you so much. I, it's just such a joy. And, and you know, I, I always want to have you back. So thank you so much for joining us on Tabernacle Talks. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I hope that people, they don't hear me, but they heard God through it all because God is needed. He's needed. And we can't say there's no God because there is. There is. So I hope that this message get across to people and they hear God, not me. He's just using me, but they hear him and they seek him because we need him. Wow. 